How are you today? Good, you good? That's good. That makes a few of us that are good. I am personally a little bit nervous. Uh, this, is a, this is a nerve wracking topic, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, it's been interesting getting ready to do this sermon. Um, I've, I've been around uh, the churches in New England and in Boston and the different regions in Boston talking about this topic, uh, but this one is different. This one feels different. Um, I was just I was talking to Justin Singletary. Justin Singletary and I talk a lot. I appreciate Justin and Marcus both wearing Adidas shoes today to kind of support their boy. Thank you guys. Um, uh, but you know, I, I so I was talking to him and I said, I, I'm nervous. This makes me nervous. And I think it's just a nerve-wracking time to do this message. It's a tough time to do this message. So bear with me. I, I promise that this will be emotional for me at some points. I promise you. I don't want it to be, but I know me. And you know me by now. And I promise you that it will be emotional for me at some points. I do want to start with what I mean, a definition about racism. If we can go to that slide, please. I'm going to read it. This is right from dictionary.com. Racism is a noun. There's the pronunciation. Here's the definition. The belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Another definition, a doctrine or political program that is based on the assumption of racism, like I just, the definition we just read, and designed to execute its principles. Or very simply put, racial prejudice or discrimination. Like I told you folks, I'm nervous about this topic. I am, I'm gonna say that a few times. Uh, because that's the best way for me to deal with nervousness is to say it. Um, I'm grateful for Zaya and uh, her heartfelt uh, testimony about who she is. I'm grateful for the condition of my birth. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be a black man. I am, I am grateful for that. <laughs> I am also grateful to be living in this country. As much turmoil as this country is going through, I'm grateful that I'm here. But more than that, thousands of times more than that, I am grateful for the condition of my rebirth. On February 24th, 1994, I was baptized into Christ. My sins were washed away and I received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the promise of heaven. I'm grateful for that, but I'm still nervous. Today is one of the most unbelievably intense racist periods that I can ever remember walking on earth. I was born in 1965. I got bused to school in Boston, but today feels like my third grade year. I was in the third grade when that was going on. It feels like my third grade year, and I'm not happy about that. Some might ask, why are we even talking about this here? Why? Why have the conversation here? I appreciate what Kevin said, and I look around, and I can't look at one row, one aisle, one column, even scarcely two people sitting next to each other that are of the same racial designation. I can't do it. I can't do it. And it's amazing, but you know what I did? When I was getting ready for this message, I Googled, I was looking for pictures from my fancy little PowerPoint. I Googled, Christians, and I could not find one group that looked like this group. They were all very homogenous. The first five or six or seven pages of the Google image search 
did not look like this. So Christianity does not look like this in our country. And yes, we call ourselves a Christian nation. But it's Christian. I like, I like the fence in front of that picture because it's Christi a Christian nation, but it has its limits, doesn't it? We're a Christian church, but we've got our issues. And today I really want to take an angle of us working on our issues. This morning, I'm calling sin, sin. I'm calling it sin. Sin is sin. That's what I do in my regular life. That's what I do in my walk with God. When I see sin in my life, I call it sin. When I see sin in my friend's life, I call it sin. When I see tr sin in my church, I'm going to call it sin. Yep. From the beginning, Satan has desired to overwhelm God's church with the sinful world that we live in. Before I continue with my first point, I'd like to pray. Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. We love you so much. And I personally am very grateful to you, God. I'm grateful, God, that you've given me the life and experience I've had. And you've given me the voice that you've given me, Father. One that God is not afraid of some circumstances or repercussions for the righteous things that I say. Father, I pray this morning that this sermon would convict and edify this congregation. Father, that we would be equipped to live in this racist world that we live in, this racist time, this racist country. Father, I, uh, sometimes when I turn on the news, I'm just speechless. But God, I pray that you would continue to speak for me here. That God, I feel so strongly that as I wrote this sermon, the Spirit took over. And I pray, God, that I would get out of the way even now as I preach it. God, thank you for loving and caring for me and my family and this congregation. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the reason why we're here is because racism is a sin. That's a scary picture. Racism is sin, and I don't think you can apologize for that picture. I don't know where you're at politically. I'm not giving a political sermon today. I'm not preaching any political ideology. I'm preaching Jesus this morning. And that's a scary picture. That's a scary. From the beginning of time, Satan has wanted to overwhelm us with sin. Here's a couple of scriptures. Genesis 4-7 says... If you will do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That's Old Testament. That's around the second sin recorded in history. That's Old Testament. Here's New Testament. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I am passionate about preaching this message here because if I don't preach this message, if we don't preach this message, if we don't embrace this message, my fear is that people in our congregation who call themselves disciples will not make it. I'm serious about this, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. I'm serious. Point number one. You okay? <laughs> I, I'm strong on this. I can't help it. I'm my mother's son. I can't help but be strong on this. Point number one is respond like a family. Open your Bibles, please. I have a scripture up there for you if you don't have one. Matthew 18, verse 15. The sub point is that functional families deal with their issues. Functional families deal with it. Verse 15 of Matthew 18 says, If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they, if they listen to you, you've won them over. What a great scripture. I'm going to tell you something. Can I tell you a little story about that scripture? I run a teen program at my job. I run a summer teen police academy. And we have rules of conduct. 
And one of our rules of conduct is about conflict reconciliation. This is the rule. Matthew 18 is the rule. I've written it out, and I've talked to them about how to resolve conflict. The rule is Matthew 18. It changes that group. I'm going to tell you, it changes that group. These are kids from the inner city of Boston that come to, my, to the police academy to participate in this program. That scripture changes the group. And people are saying, how did those two kids from two different gang neighborhoods work out their conflict? And I say they obeyed the rule. They obeyed the rule. If brothers and sisters, if kids from inner city broken families can hear the power of that scripture and obey that scripture, I want to ask you if you can. Can you do it? Functional families work out their issues. Another sub point is that functional families are compassionate. I want to introduce you to some people here. You got that census record there? Oh, you can't read it, can you? I'll tell you what it is. Okay? I'm going to introduce you to three people. They're kind of highlighted there. One is my grandfather, Walter Brown. Walter Brown was probably the kindest and funniest guy I have ever met in my life. I would sit, we would go to Arkansas for the summer. I would spend all day talking to him, or I would try to, because in the evenings he would be a little bit intoxicated and hard to talk to. <laughs> but I would talk to him until I couldn't anymore, all day. He was so funny. He was so funny. And then the next line down is his wife, my grandmother, Leona Brown. Now, if you've ever eaten Van or Daryl Owens' fried chicken, you've met Leona Brown a little bit. You've met her a little bit. Like, I know when, if it's cooking in a cast iron pan, I know when to turn it over. I do. Because I sat in the kitchen with Leona Brown. And then there's a third person in that highlighted section. You, you can probably read this one. It says Viola Ray. Do you see that? Yeah. This is a census taken in 1940. Grandpa was 21. Grandma was 24. And Viola Ray was 79. Do the math. Do the math. Viola Ray was born in 18. 1861. Viola Ray was born a slave. This is from a sharecropping plantation in Lone Oak, Arkansas. Viola Ray was born a slave. I remember telling my mother about this particular picture on Mother's Day. And she said, I remember her. I said, wait, what? She said, I remember her. I was a little baby but there was somebody that used to sleep in a room and I wasn't supposed to bother her, but I would go in and comb her hair. And I remember in that sharecropping, my mother lived in that sharecropping house. My mother was born in that sharecropping house. And she said, I, I'm having flashes of memory right now of her wake in our living room. Viola Ray was a slave. Viola Ray is about five generations away from me. But my mother touched her. My mother knew her. She knew my mother. So I'm going to ask a favor. Don't ever tell me that I should be over slavery. It's in my family. It's one generation away from where we are right now. One. Initially, I thought, because sometimes I could feel this stuff. Like when I was Googling that, uh, the, I tried to Google pictures of racism, and I, I came up with that one. That was from Charlottesville last year. That was from Charlottesville last year. I got scared when I Googled that. I, I felt afraid. And then I said, what, what are you doing, man? You, it's been so long. And then I thought about Viola Ray. And I thought about my mother. 
families take care of their issues and they respond with compassion. Point number two. Let me drink some water, sorry. Come on, Daryl. I got this big old water bottle that I don't want to put right there, so. So I gotta bend over. Okay, here we go. All right, point number two. You okay? You all right? Again, I know this is strong and I ain't sorry, okay? Uh, I, I do, I know it's strong, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry if I offend you. I want to talk to you if I have, but I ain't sorry if it's strong. Respond to people and not politics is point number two. I don't have this scripture up on the, on the, on the PowerPoint, but in Revelation, God, Jesus cast to the Apostle John a vision for the church. In the book of Revelation, Jesus casts a vision for John. It's in Revelation 7, 9. I don't have it there, but it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne of the Lamb. Jesus allowed John to get a peek at the celebration that the faithful will enjoy in heaven. Jesus said, come with me, John. I'm going to show you a preview, man. I'm going to show you what this is going to look like, my man. Take a look. Every tribe, every nation, we are tribal, are we not? Human beings who walk the earth right now, we're tribal. We look to be with people who look like us, unfortunately. That's <laughs> really unfortunate for me. I'm like, whoa, I don't want to be. Dude, what's that? <laughs> this is not God's plan. God does not, has not planned for us to be tribal. I, I said this to Barbara this morning. Racism is such an affront to God. It is such an affront to him. This mosaic is painted by God's hand. This beautiful picture is painted by his hand. The subtleties in skin tone between even me and my wife are painted by God. How dare one of us say, because God painted me a different color, I'm better than you. How dare we say that it's an affront to God. It is, racism is nearly irreverent. It is, it's disgusting, it's gross but yet we're affected by it. Yet we are affected by it. It is, it is hard. I think of my daughters, Jordan and Haley, right? I told Barbara this this morning. Imagine, you know, when, we, when they were babies, we kind of assigned, they're both girls, they're both, they're close to in age, we assigned them their favorite color, which they summarily rebelled against later on. But we assigned Jordan pink, and we assigned Haley yellow, right? <laughs> they barely wear any pink or yellow now, or we did that to them, but, but we assigned them their colors. I said to Barbara, imagine if we had heard Jor excuse me, Jordan saying to Haley, I'm better than you because they gave me pink. Or imagine we had heard Haley saying to Jordan, you know, I'm better than you because they gave me yellow. It would be an affront to us. It would be insulting to us. It would make us angry. And it would hurt us deeply. God feels the same about racism. Don't go thinking that racism is just my culture. Don't go thinking that. If I was to follow my culture from the men that I had to inspire me as a kid, I'm gonna tell you, I'd be jacked up. I wouldn't be standing right here in front of you right now. It wouldn't be racism. It would be drug dealing, prostitution, robbery, drug use, womanizing, woman beating. So you, you wouldn't give me a pass by saying, it's my culture, man. <laughs> I'm doing all this stuff. Deal with it, bro, it's my culture. You wouldn't, you wouldn't give me a pass. I am not giving you a pass. God is not giving you a pass. 
If you struggle with racism, I am calling you to repent. If you know somebody that struggles with racism, I am calling you to be patient as God is patient. Let's go to a scripture in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is God's vision, not a, a future cast vision, but this is now. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I am so overjoyed and thrilled to be a Christian. I am so overjoyed and thrilled to see where God has taken me the adventure in discipleship and leadership and friendship that God has taken me. Joe Gattosi sitting right over there. That's one of my best friends on the planet. That's my brother, brother right there. My brother, brother, brother is Van sitting right there. But Joe gets two. <laughs> Joe gets a brother, brother. We are, we are very different. We are extremely different. And believe it or not, Joe's the nice one. He really is. He really is. He's the nice one of the two of us when we're at teen camp. He is. Oh, sure, I'll help you. Go talk to Daryl. No, I don't want to talk to Daryl. Joe's the nice one. But this royal nation, this set-apart race, that God is talking about through Peter here in this letter is not your ethnicity. It is not your political party. It is not your gender. It is not your political belief system. It is not your nationality. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the president of your nation. Jesus Christ is the ruler, the director, the example, the savior of your nation. You can be like Zaya here. You can wrestle with all of your identities, but Jesus is there cheering for you to choose me as your identity. I died so that you could choose me as your identity. So how do we respond? Well, yeah, I, t I said it earlier, right? We respond like a family, like a functional one, right? We deal with issues and we have compassion. And then I said, we respond to people, not politics. Some of us get hooked there. Some of us get caught there. Some of us want to retranslate Matthew 18, 15 to say, if your brother sins against you, post it so that 300 people can read it. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's sinful. It is merciless. It is mean-spirited. It's wrong. It makes me angry but not because it's me. It makes me angry because God has called me to lead his people and to love his people and to fight for the unity of his people. When you, little you, when little bitty you thinks that you can solve the church's problems with a post, you are wrong. And you need to repent and you need to stop it. Matthew 18 does not talk about posting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jesus didn't know about posting. Yes, he did. <laughs> Jesus didn't know about Facebook. Yes, he did. You're not called to post. Repent of that if you're doing it. Amen? Amen. The third point, and my last point. Our responses must be redemptive and not reactionary. We're a pretty young church, sharp on social media, 
but we must be redemptive and not reactionary. Further, church, be careful how you joke. Be careful how you joke. I've, I've been in mixed company when someone has decided to start spewing racially tinged jokes. Racial humor. And I see it. I know sometimes the speaker of the joke doesn't see it. But I see it. Because I can feel it. And I can see that one person who responds like this. Sometimes the joker continues. But in that crowd, that multiracial crowd of 10, 15, 20, 30 people sometimes, and someone's pop, 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 piping off their racially tinged jokes, I see it. That one person that goes, because they've been hurt. Because they've been hurt. Those racially tinged jokes, that's racism. That's sin. You need to repent if you're doing that. And I'm saying that because I want to redeem you. I don't want to react, but I'm I think you can hear in my voice that racism causes grief. I'm, I'm grieved by it. I choose to grieve and cleave. I choose to because God chose me and I believe that's how Jesus reacts to my sin. He grieves, but he cleaves. I choose not to shock and shun. I choose not to do that. I choose to grieve and cleave, not shock and shun. I think some of us can do that. I think some of us can, can get offended or shocked by something racist or something perce perceptually racist that another person in our group can say and you get shocked and you shun them. That's also wrong. That's also wrong. It's not the pattern laid out in Matthew 18. I'll read your story here. I'm going to give you a background. It's just one scripture. but So, so there's a case for redemptive statement by one of the most famous apostles that's ever walked the earth. Paul. Paul. Peter, another one of the most famous apostles that walked the earth, was struggling with racism. Peter had been hanging out with some Gentiles. Those are non-Jews, for those of you who don't know that word. Peter had been hanging out with some non-Jews, and they were kicking it. They were having a good time. He was eating with them. He was chilling with them. They were cool. But when other prominent Jews showed up, Peter kind of backed off. He was like, hold on, wait, don't, don't, I'll call you later. Like, <laughs> right? Peter kind of backed off. I think he was a little bit ashamed to be so bold and obey what God told him to do in eating with Gentiles. The Apostle Paul came to town and listen to what Paul said. Cephas is Peter here. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Ha <laughs> ha, that's Matthew 18, baby. You gotta do it with love, but it's gotta be face to face. It's gotta be with love, but it's gotta be face to face. Don't get all hurt about somebody doing something that you perceive as racist and then come talk to me. I wasn't even there. I don't know what you're talking about. Go talk to that person. But the conversation needs to be redemptive and not reactionary. Look what Paul says. Because he stood condemned. I opposed him face to face because if I didn't, he was at risk of going to hell. 
He was at risk of losing his salvation because at that moment, he was struggling. God gave Peter a vision from heaven about mixing it up with the Gentiles. You can read about that yourself later. I don't have the scripture reference for you. But a sheet floated down from heaven with all kinds of food on it. And Jesus told Peter, hey, man, go eat with them, man. And eat what they serve you because I'm spreading this thing out. Peter, that's a paraphrase, by the way. Um, <laughs> Peter, <laughs> Peter had received a, a vision from Jesus, but because of social pressure, he was ignoring the vision he perceived from Jesus. How do you deal with social pressure and race? How do you deal with it? I think we do okay here. I think we do okay here. But we don't do okay with not being reactive, but to be redemptive in our conversation. The strength of this confrontation, and you can read it, it goes on to say what the confrontation was about right in Galatians 2. You can go on to read some more. The strength of this confrontation was guided by redemption, not a mere reaction or retaliation. Sometimes we can get a feeling that somebody gives us and we want to return the feeling. That's not what Paul was doing. In fact, Paul was a Jew. He calls himself a Jew among Jews earlier in the scriptures. Paul was a Jew. He may have felt some of the same temptations. But he went and he opposed Peter to his face for his racist behavior. In his face. Because he stood condemned at the time of the confrontation. Sometimes, this is one of the things, now, many of you don't know, but I train police officers for a living. Many of you do know that, actually. But I'm a police officer. I train cops for a living. And one of the things I've been teaching lately is de-escalation. Teaching cops how to talk to people in cri at crisis points instead of reacting. I'm teaching them redemption over reaction. The reactions are all physical. And I'm teaching them to control those with distance and time and conversation instead of reacting physically. I'm teaching that. And one of the things I teach for them in this conversation, officers, there is no content except for baseline. There is no content except for baseline. You want to bring the person back down to baseline to a point where they can think clearly and speak clearly and relax their muscles and talk to you in a reasonable fashion. That's what you're doing. There's no content. Don't worry about what they, how you might be insulted, offended, or marginalized in the conversation. Focus on the baseline. For Christians, you know what our baseline is? It's unity. Your baseline, disciples of Jesus, is unity. There is no content in these redemptive conversations except for your baseline, which is unity. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning his shame. You are the joy set before him. You are the joy set before Jesus. There is no baseline except for unity. But, 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 he said, but, 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 but. Yeah, I know. I get it. Jesus gets it but there's no content except for unity. Do you want to know why Joe and I are best friends? Because in our relationship, there's no content except for unity. I've said stupid things in the presence of Joe Gatozzi that have had to be corrected by Joe Gatozzi. Joe Gatozzi has said stupid things in the presence of Daryl Owens that have had to be corrected by Daryl Owens. But in those conversations where we're correcting, there's no content except for unity. There's no personal hurt. There's no animosity that goes back generations. There's no unspoken tension. There's none of that. There's only unity. Hey, oop, we got a blip here. Something's affecting our unity. Let's get back to baseline. Jesus desired this. I'm going to close here, and I apologize that I cannot cover 400 plus years in 45 minutes or less. 
You can cover it in your prayer life. You can cover it in your conversations. You can cover it by being a functional family the way I've called you to. I apologize for not being as thorough as this issue calls us to be. My big brother is preaching to you next week. I think he's going to cover, he's, gonna, he's, he's already stitching up some holes in my, in, in my garment here. So I, I know that it's going to be thorough and great. But I want to close with a prayer that Jesus said for the believers. John 17, verse 20. You know what, let's, you can read it if you want, but let's pray. Let's pray. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That call of them, that all of them, sorry, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our baseline is unity, brothers and sisters. I hope this has been helpful. I love you all. Thank you.